Welcome back, friends and neighbors, to this video series about networking. My name is Bruce Hartpence, a faculty member here at RIT, and I will be your host. To find out more about what we've been doing in these videos, you can visit BruceHartpence.com. Thanks very much for listening. We are currently wading through Chapter 3 in the Packet Guide to Voice over IP, and we are talking about SIP. This is Part 2 in the series. So without further ado, on to SIP. Last time we went through some of the SIP details, and so I didn't want to go on very much farther without talking about the Session Descriptor Protocol, which is a part of SIP, or at least it's encapsulated in SIP. Uh, SDP is formalized in RFC 4566. And what SDP does for us that SIP doesn't do is describe what's in the call, what we're going to be using for the media session or this, the, uh, the call itself. And that includes things like the media type and the codec. We'll take a look at a, a packet here in a second. Connection info such as the IP address. And then there's a session name, and it's just a name that we use to more easily refer to the collection of packets that constitutes the, the session. Uh, the duration, and there's actually a whole bunch of, bunch of stuff in the uh, STP packets. Now for those of you that are familiar with H.323, those types of calls start with H.225 to set up the call, and that's where SIP comes in. But to give us the information about the session itself, H.323 uses H.245, and that's kind of the place that SDP fits for SIP. So here's an example SDP packet. You can see there's an awful lot of information about the codec there, but there's also the IP address that we're using. There's our time description. Uh, and so this is the information about the call. If you take a look at the line that's highlighted there, you'll see audio 34008. That's actually the port that we're going to use. And so if we looked at the RTP packets that come up later on in this conversation, you would see that RTP is actually using that particular port for the conversation. Now this is again similar to what H.245 does with H.323. It sets up the, the connection, tells us how we're going to drop out of our signaling protocol and into our transport protocol. So let's take a second and return to SIP. So we talked about the, some basic structure. SIP has, you know, the to and the from uh, values. SIP also has the um, call ID. This is how we identify all the packets that go along with the, this particular call. It has sequence numbers, the, the methods that are supported, SIP addressing that is used. Those are all part of the SIP packets, but I didn't show you yet the collection of packets that's used on a regular basis. So on this particular image, what we see on the top part here is a phone starting up. So we're going to see that the phone registers, swap some details about the supported uh, methods, and then we return a couple of statuses here from both sides. Now the collection of packets below that, you can sort of see that the number changes. So you went from packet numbers 112 through 115, and then we had packets that were 10 through 25 here. And that's because we're looking at two different captures. They're from the same phones, but two different parts of the operation. So the first part is the phone starting up, finding the call server and registering. And then the second one is an actual call. And so in this case, 1.11 here has initiated the call, goes out to the call server and says, hey, I want to call this guy. So we can see that there's the invite that goes and then the trying and ringing messages, and then we have the connection is actually made with the, the SIP or SDP packets being swapped to describe how we're going to set up this session. And then we drop into RTP, which is our transport protocol. Now the other thing that I'd like to point out here are those statuses or the codes. And so in this, these packets here, we can see the status of 100, 180, 200, and that's because we've got a couple of very common codes here, provisional codes and then success codes, and I'll, I'll outline those a little bit for you later on. And in this image, you're just isolating those SIP packets that have something to do with the call. Now, what I also wanted to point out here is that a very handy tool in Wireshark and OmniPeak and other 
packet capture analysis software tools is the ability to flowchart the conversation. And so this becomes an important skill for us, not only in being able to read one of these diagrams, but actually be able to generate one. And so here we can see the two sides of the conversation, 1.1 and 1.11, and, and here are the messages flowing back and forth as indicated by the arrows. So this is who's sending the message to who and the codes that go along with it. And then, of course, we can see the RTP stream toward the, the, the middle bottom. And then lastly, we see a SIP message that we haven't actually talked about yet, and that's how we close down a SIP conversation with the SIP by message and then the acknowledgement coming from the other side. And these are the SIP codes here. I mentioned that the 1XX, those are provisional codes. We don't really know what's going on. There's not a real problem. We're just sort of waiting. We see this very commonly when nodes are trying to contact each other with invites, and especially when we're going across between call servers. The 200 series, or the 2XX series, those are happy codes. That tells you that what you were trying to do worked. 3XX means some form of redirect, again, very commonly between systems. Anything that begins with a, with a 4, 5, or 6, that's bad. These are error codes of some kind, and hopefully we can stay away from those. But if you're trying to set up a SIP trunk or something like that, and you're getting annoying tones in your phones when you're trying to call, it's likely that you're generating 4XX, 5XX, 6XX error code messages. All right, as we get ready to wind down today, I wanted to close up with SIP trunks and SIP security a little bit. SIP trunks are one of those things that everybody talks about. Sometimes they seem a little bit confusing, but if we take a look at what is referred to as the SIP trapezoid, this is an image right out of the SIP RFCs. You can see that I've tried to include all the reference information for the image as I didn't make this one. We can see that there are two maybe call servers or proxies here, and we see Alice and Bob on the two sides there. So if you can imagine a system that Alice is residing on as having one particular set of dial patterns. So here at RIT, we're at all, everything begins with a 475. And over there at Bob's phone, maybe everything begins with 777. So anytime you're calling from Alice to anybody in Alice's organization, it's handled by the local call servers. But when you're trying to call somebody outside, you've got to have sort of a gateway to send this to. And that's really what SIP trunks are all about. So Alice's proxy or Alice's call server recognizes that when she dials 777, it's destined for the network that Bob resides on. And so it's got to be sent to the other end of the SIP trunk, in this case, the Biloxi.com proxy. In the same way, when Bob wants to call Alice, he's got to dial 475. And so that dial pattern is being recognized as being part of Atlanta. So there are two parts to a SIP trunk. One is what dial pattern are you trying to reach? And then what is the account or endpoint that's associated with this particular dial pattern? And that's pretty much the nuts and bolts of a SIP trunk. If you are a networking kind of person, SIP trunking is not unlike static or default routing. So that's kind of what we have to do. We have to set up a dial pattern or a network pattern and send it to somebody, and then they have to figure out a way to send it back to us. Okay, SIP and RTP security. Well, if you were taking a look at voice over IP security, the two big weaknesses that we have are going to be in SIP and RTP, although for different reasons. SIP is very easy to read and understand, so that means the SIP uh, signaling messages, such as registration, such as calls, invites, they're all very easy to spoof. And so SIP is susceptible to injects and hijacks and man-in-the-middle attacks. Now, as you, as you saw from the packet capture, and especially if you've been reading the chapter, the SIP header format and the SIP fields are actually very easy to understand. So again, for an attacker, that makes it very easy to read. Now, RTP has a completely different problem. RTP, as you may remember, is the transport protocol. And so you encode the audio or the video with a particular codec and then send it across. And so if you just had the data, you would have no idea what it means. But RTP is very handy in that it tells you exactly what codec was used to encode this data. 
with G.711 being the most popular one. So that means that anybody that understands how a codec works and that has support for the codec that you used can be fed your packets and then replay them. So for those of you that are fans of Wireshark or OmniPeak, both of them have the ability to play back G.711 streams. And so that's the basic problem with RTP, is that you can collect RTP packets and then play them back at random. You can also inject RTP packets into streams by giving them the same, the same values as the RTP stream and just direct them at the, the destination IP address. But the most common problem is with replay. Well, I see that we're out past 10 minutes here, so that'll about do it for this episode. Next week, we're going to talk about codecs, and that'll be another chapter in the Packet Guide to Voice over IP. Cruise around BruceHartPence.com, see what we've got posted up there, and of course, there's always the videos here. Thanks very much for listening, thanks very much for watching, and may your packets always reach their destinations.